So this presentation was given at the Green Chemistry and Engineering Conference in Bethesda, Maryland on June 19th, 2013. In this presentation, I talk about um, the post reductionist model of STEM learning. Can it help ca the cause of green chemistry? And in this presentation, I talk about sustained slope. The outline of the presentation is that we begin. I begin by talking about the need for the post-reductionist um, model in ed, in um, education and in engineering, and I talk about the specific way that we're trying to um, experiment with that in San Luis Obispo with the sustained slow learning initiative. Then I also particularly look at the chemistry class that we taught within sustained slow, and um, discuss how that um, actually was done within that learning initiative. I also touch on a little bit of research data. We don't have much done at this point in time, but there, there I do go over um, a few of the results that we have. For the last 200 years, um, we have been making progress in a reductionist kind of model, and it began in the in the Industrial Revolution. Me being an industrial engineer by by training, I'm really familiar with this model of breaking things down into the smallest possible pieces so that you might be able to um, make improvements in those pieces. And this, is, this has been translated into higher education in this way, where we take a bunch of people who come into the system at varying places and at varying levels, and we produce them into... Um, into people that are able to do the professional job. And the way we do that is we specify a bunch of courses that we're going to take that we call a curriculum. And these are these then these people are produced to some sort of specification. They're very independent oriented, they're profit driven, um, they're competitive in nature because a lot of what they've seen has been in this competitive mode. And we really know that this has worked good to make, to develop a lot of really good innovations, but there actually have been a lot of un unintended consequences. So we really ask ourselves, is there a different way of doing that? And of course we can make changes in courses or we can make changes in curriculum, but we actually feel that those will not change the entire system. And what is necessary is to actually look at the assumptions of, of the system we're participating in. So if we look at education as a whole, and I look at the assumptions un about in the educational model as it is right now, I can uh, articulate some of those. The first here is that students are generally lazy and must be forced to do the work. Sort of a force model that it's uh, that it they need to have some sort of external pressure or um, force to do things. The faculty, it's the faculty's responsibility to define each topic and activity. So this idea that is really faculty driven and faculty centric to decide what should be covered um, in an educational system. Students learn the best in the face of competition. So if there's a competitive model where students strive to beat somebody else, that that is a system that we feel is or that we operate under as an ideal. Um, and also we, we really bring to, to our teaching the assumptions that students actually don't like the topics we teach, that they are not engaged in it and they don't think it's interesting. And also, to go along with that, is that the sub subjects we teach are most important. There's a lot of other subjects that are taught in um, higher ed, but we often feel the one we're teaching is the most important. And also that lecturing is the most efficient method of teaching. I think we all agree that it's maybe not the most effective, but it is the most efficient, covering a broad range of people in a um, quick and efficient manner. As an, and then we also think things like, as an expert in my field, I know all the necessary topics. I know everything there is to know. I am the expert and I am going to tell you about that. And that my habits are very different from student habits. The things I do, the way I work, are very different from students. I keep myself separate from them. All the topics I cover in class are important, and there are quite a few. So this idea that there's both a breadth of topics and then a depth that's necessary in, in, the, top, in the class that I teach. And that I must teach these topics so well so that students can use them later in courses or in life. So this is the idea of banking these. We deposit this into the students and they will be able to withdraw the, that knowledge later when they either in later courses or in life when they have to apply it. Now you can probably recognize many of these assumptions of your own education and also of the current educational system. Well we really looked at these assumptions and said can we change that? Can we do it differently? And we developed sort of um, different ways of working on things. So initially, we believe students are enthusiastic about learning if it's relevant topics and in content. 
So students actually want to learn some things. And if we see that, we see that they, they actually are investigating some things that are of interest to them. Students have their own interests, and actually these can be incorporated into the course. So we can draw on what students are interested in and, and include those in course content. Students learn best in a nurturing collaborative environment. There's actually a lot of research that supports this, that students actually learn best when they feel supported. And also the idea that actually I do love the topic I teach and that we can show that. We can show our own emotions about the topic and our own passion. Um, and this actually helps the learning, uh, learning environment. Students learn because they want to make a difference in the world. If we look at students as trying to do something different for themselves and for the world and that that motivates their learning, it actually does a different thing in the classroom. Self-directed and individual's learning is the most effective. The individualized learning is actually one of the engineering grand challenges to try to develop things that are going to be more individualized to a particular person where they come where they come into the system. The world needs less experts and more systems thinkers. Really, this idea that an expert is the best way to be is should not should be put aside. Someone who can understand the interconnectedness of different topics is much more valuable. Many of my habits are very similar to the students. When I look at my tendency to procrastinate or that I am influenced in my work by all kinds of other things that are going on in my life, I am not at all different than the students. And this coming alongside helps, helps us to become co-learners in processes. And I also actually wonder if the all the topics I cover are very important. I wonder that. I mean, we, I kind of function under that, but I'm not really sure that it's true. And I must teach topics that student, students can apply immediately. So I try to teach things that are more of a pull system, that the students will use them immediately in their work and not something that they will put in their brain to retrieve later. So giving this all this set of assumptions that we're trying to actually re redo and re reinvigorate these kinds of assumptions, we actually developed um, Sustain Slow, a learning initiative. Now I want to be clear that this learning initiative is not really something that we feel feel everybody should be doing. This is not a generalizable or this should not be someone that everybody should take into account. This is just what we developed in San Luis Obispo, Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, as an innovative way of educating. Um, we, we go by some principles, we honor the whole is kind of our motto, is that we really include everybody in the system as being honored, including administration and the, um, the need for financial um, oversight, things like that. And, and some of these, some of these um, corollaries are listed here, where learners, are free, learners will freely choose to educate themselves. We believe that. A strong community of students, faculty, and community partners are, are actually important for this whole process. We often use a flipped classroom, and we depend on intrinsic motivation to um, help learning. And then also there's, there's actually quite a few changes in the grading method. And there's other things associated with sustained slope, but these are just the ones that I'm touching on here. So in order to explain sustained slow, it might be good to go through a um, kind of an explanation of, of the contrast between a traditional university. So this being a traditional university where a student would take four courses indicated by these black circles um, and there are faculty teaching each one of these courses and students sitting in rows generally. Um, sometimes they're collaborating in class, but not much. In fact, in my, and, and I had some res a student doing research last year and she found that between 85 and 90 percent of the time students are in classes they are actually sitting listening to lectures so it's still quite prevalent in each of the courses we um, this the there are learning objectives that should be covered in those courses and sometimes they're community projects that are outside extracurricular um, there's a group of students maybe working with a club or um, some kind of community service or maybe part of a part of a class but it's generally kind of separate from the classroom. So we actually asked ourselves, could we redraw the boundaries of the system to be a little bit different? And what we ended up doing is saying, we're gonna draw it around all the courses and hopefully include some of the projects too. And we, we called this sort of our learning community. And what we do then is we're gonna take students from the various courses and they're going to apply the learning objectives to a project and then this created sort of a learning community where faculty act as coaches in the process so they help students to achieve learning objectives and to make progress on the projects. They learn in context so whatever they're working on actually has meaning because they're engaged in the local community.
they're working on community projects. We have about 15 to 20 community um, partners, and they range in from non-profit profits to small businesses to um, activist groups. So there's all different kinds of um, community partners that are joined with Sustain So. We also, um, impo we also encourage self-directed learning, where students take ownership of their own learning in the process. Um, it, we, we, this is the second year that we've done this, so we're just finishing the second year in June 2013. We had between 40 and 50 students in, the, in each of the first two cohorts. We want to get 100 next year. That is our, our goal that we think would be financially um, attainable. And the students take classes for two quarter sequence, and there's five to seven faculty um, teaching these classes. Each quarter, the students take and take three integrated GE courses. There's a list of some of the courses. And then again, there's 15 to 20 community partners. I'm gonna just do a little bit of illustration about the chemistry class so you can see how some of that integration was taking place. The format of the chemistry class was that there was two hours a week in dialogue um, about chemistry in context. So we talked about um, chem we talked about current events, we talked about chemistry on their projects, we talked about actually quite a bit about chemistry and physics and the connection between those two. Then there was also two hours where students were working in, in studio. They weren't required to show up, but they were uh, working on projects or problems with faculty or without faculty. There was also a lot of use of online resources. We used Alex, which is a um, self-directed, self-paced um, program that helped the students um, really work on the things that they needed to work on. The grading, there was also kind of two changes in the grading. We actually had one test where the students could pass a, a, the test, and they had two tries at this test, and it was a common final for chemistry. Um, all the students passed it. And then in addition, they had to work on a quest project. So some examples were that there was a student that was very interested in bees and honey and was working on that within her um, community project. And so she did some chemistry around that. There was also a student that was interested in AIDS and um, it, because he was working with AIDS support networks. So he did some analysis on the chemistry of AIDS. And um, through that, you could see that they were applying the things they were learning to their projects. One of the things that was interesting to us is that we found that over time the students don't learn like maybe we imagined they should. We thought that they should be working a little bit of a time every week of the quarter and try to get to try to get to the learning objectives. Because we could track Alex, we saw something that looked a little bit like this. This isn't exact numbers, but this is a little bit what it worked, looked like. Students were slowly, slowly working on stuff until the very end of the quarter when they knew the test was coming up, and then they completely crammed. Now, some of, as faculty, we were just confused about, well, is this a good thing or not? Well, I think that it actually is what it is, and that students often behave like this in, an earn, in a learning situation. And for us to be able to see into that and actually trust that process was something new for us.